Good evening. I'm Gosha Ford. I'm one of the, of the librarians at Health Sciences Library System, and I'm the one who is responsible for the exhibit we currently have downstairs of um, Doc Savage, the Supreme Adventurer and Physician. Associated with this um, exhibit is today's event. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Mark Best. Dr. Best is a lecturer in English and Film Studies. He holds a PhD from Indiana University. He has taught film and literature courses and subjects including new media, the Western and superhero genre, world film history and analysis, American film history, and John Ford. His research interests include the, the American superhero genre and gender in the Cold War era, the Bible in popular culture, and Japanese science fiction film and television. This semester, he is also teaching a course in film studies on superheroes on film and television. In addition, Dr. Best is currently working on a book project on Japanese giant monster movies, specifically the history of the Gamera film series from the 60s to the present. Um, and we are for a special treat tonight. Thank you. Uh, so, this is where we begin with this image from a, a relatively recent comic book. 2000, it's not that recent, but uh, where we have the, uh, the character Dr. Midnight and Black Canary, and Dr. Midnight has just introduced himself to Black Canary, and as she says, uh, let's just say I've run into more than a few Dr. Fill in the Blank long underwear types who haven't even come close to taking the Hippocratic Oath. So her comment points to a, an issue that is central to this, this sort of getting started on this project, this talk tonight, uh, the uses of the word uh, doctor, especially in the names of superheroes of the superhero genre. <clears throat> this comic book is a, is a series joining new versions of some of DC Comics' earliest characters in the Justice Society of America, the JSA stands for. And to get into this issue of uses of the name doctor, the designation doctor, I want to go back to the early days of the genre. An early example of the Justice Society, All-Star Comics number 14 from 1943, where we have some of national periodicals, which later became DC Comics, some of the earliest characters uh, uh, on this uh, World War II era cover. So we have, from left to right, Johnny Thunder, Dr. Midnight, Inspector, Wonder Woman, Hawkman, Starman, uh, Sandman, The Atom, and Dr. Fate. So on either side of this team of superheroes, we have two doctors. Dr. Uh, Midnight and Dr. Fate. Two characters who have existed in multiple iterations in the DC Universe for over 80 years. Let's start with Dr. Fate. So Dr. Fate uh, is uh, uh, Kent Nelson. This is, this, is, this is his real name. He's the son of an archaeologist who, after his father's death, is raised and trained by an ancient sorcerer who gains mystical power. And he names him Dr. Fate, as you can see in this uh, lower set of panels. <clears throat> in other words, in this case, we have the term doctor being used to suggest authority and perhaps specialized knowledge. In this case, mastery of the supernatural. In other words, the most common use of doctor in a superhero genre, the doctor as expert. Most typically a scientist, uh, someone with a PhD in a specific field, perhaps. So, for example, uh, some other notable examples here. Dr. Manhattan, Dr. John Ostrander, physicist from Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen series from the 1980s. Um, Dr. Vincent Von, uh, Victor Von Doom, uh, a genius inventor whose pride causes his downfall. He's an inventor, sorcerer, and tyrant ruler of Latvia. Uh, he's a, a supervillain and arch enemy of the Fantastic Four. He's not a physician. So, doctor as expert, the doctor as perhaps mad doctor or mad scientist, in the case of Dr. Doom. And we have the same sort of thing with many, many other Marvel superheroes who are uh, scientists in their secret identity. So Dr. Hank Pym, uh, 
uh, Ant-Man, Dr. Hank McCoy, uh, the Beast from the X-Men, Dr. Bruce Banner, the Incredible Hulk, uh, Dr. Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic with the Fantastic Four, all proper titles indicating their status in their scientific fields. So uh, the use of the of doctor in those cases defines uh, more the secret identity than the superhero. Uh, and the scientific research that these doctors undertake is often central to their origin as a superhero. So Hank Pym invents pin particles which allow him to shrink to ant size, or, uh, or Dr. Bruce Banner, you do an experiment with the gamma rays, becomes the Incredible Hulk, and the like. <clears throat> so doctor as expert, doctor as specialist, but not doctor as physician. Now, returning to Dr. Fate, mystical doctor, I should note, for the sake of fairness, that Dr. Fate does have a brief stint as a medical intern uh, in the early 1940s. Uh, he does become an actual physician for a while. Dr. Fate, as a physician, Kent Nelson as a physician, in the, his, his physician identity used to introduce some crime scenarios. But at the same time, Kent Nelson also becomes a U.S. Army paratrooper in 1943. In 1944, he becomes an archaeologist like his father, which remains his occupation in later uh, iterations of the same character, of the same secret identity. So Dr. S. Expert. We can consider Doc Savage, the focus of the exhibit, as a similar example. Uh, Doc Savage seen by many to be the foremost precursor to the superhero, or even the first superhero, although I would say this is rather difficult to determine. It depends very much on your definition of superhero. Uh, in this talk, in my, for my position, I'm using the term, or def rather defining the superhero uh, as sharing familiar conventions like costumes, superpowers, secret identity, and the like, which is not really Doc Savage. So Doc Savage is more precursor to that type of superhero. But in the case of Doc Savage, the doctor in Doc Savage does refer to his status as a physician, but it also refers to his status as master of other fields and professions, so chemistry, engineering, law, and the like. So his role as a physician is just one of the many skill sets that he has, which, and it is that range of skill sets that makes him superior to other men and defines his status as a superhero. And when I use, I use the term men very intentionally here, since the superhero genre has traditionally been predominantly male in its heroes and male-oriented in its target audience. So the doctor is expert. The doc, and Doc Savage does do a lot of doctoring in Doc Savage stories. His medical skills are brought to bear in many situations, whether, whether it is uh, uh, helping individual characters who have been injured or the like, or doing research to cure disease on a, large scale, on a larger scale or the like. But again, this is one of many skill sets of Doc Savage, Dr. Morris, expert, than just specifically physician. So we return to the Justice Society again, and the other doctor on the other end of this spectrum of heroes, uh, Dr. Midnight, where we have, early in the superhero hero genre, the other use of doctor, the doctor as an actual physician. Also suggesting authority and expertise, but specifically authority in medicine, medical fields. Dr. Midnight begins as a research scientist, this is from uh, his origin story in 1941, a uh, medical research scientist, Dr. Charles McNighter, surgeon, medical research scientist, who is, um, uh, he is blinded by a uh, criminal attack. So criminals are trying to kill one of his patients, uh, who is a, a witness to a crime, and McNider is injured in this attack, and here we have the revelation of his blindness, the doom of his professional career. He cannot be a physician if he cannot see. So notice the language used here. He'll live, but he'll never be able to use his eyes again. What a pity. He did so much for humanity. So the, the, uh, the loss of vision is the equivalent of a loss of career. He might as well be dead. However, he's not, and instead he switches to uh, writing detective fiction, as one does when one is a physician who has been blinded, apparently. Uh, and his nurse and research assistant becomes uh, 
uh, is in many ways, and she takes dictation from him. She writes down his stories, always in her nurse uniform, which is kind of curious, but that's, that's I guess, so we can recognize that that's who she is. <clears throat> However, he discovers, Charles McNagher discovers that he can see in the dark. So rather than, and, and he develops a, uh, he uses a scientific knowledge to develop a set of tools uh, to, to help him in general. So infrared glasses that enable to, him to see during the day, which would enable him to continue his medical career, career but he decides to continue to feign blindness so that he be, can, can become a vigilante superhero. So it, his, his own blindness allows him to see in the dark, his infrared glasses allow him to see during the day, he invents blackout bombs, which uh, give him an advantage in fights. His criminals can't see, but he can. And he has a cool pet owl named Hootie, as you can see on his shoulder. So he takes on this vigilante superhero. Uh, again, he still has physician skills that come to bear in his stories, but publicly he remains a blind detective fiction writer. We have an image from 1947, after the war, where uh, a member of the underworld is trying to convince his colleagues that Dr. McKnighter and Dr. Midnight are the same person, uh, same height, same weight. Of course, they'll be skeptical because everybody knows that Charles McKnighter is blind. Uh, I'm especially fond of this image because having known these characters for a very long time, it was only when I was preparing for this talk that I made the connection between McKnighter and Midnight which made me feel more dumb about superheroes than I normally feel, but there you go. So Dr. McKnighter, Dr. Midnight. So this is the kind of superhero we're interested in, in here. The use of the physician role for defining superheroes, their specific characters and their powers. So I'm interested now in how the role of medical doctor is used to define the heroic masculinity of the superhero, when the hero is also a physician. One key trait that the superhero lack, uh, uh, one key trait of the superhero that Doc Savage lacks is the secret identity. And Doc Savage is Dr. Clark Savage Jr. There's not a dual identity, there's no disguising Doc Savage as somebody else with a light. Uh, in contrast to these examples of costume vigilantes, the function of the secret identity, the, the secret identity has multiple functions in the superhero genre. So the, uh, uh, in, in its narrative functions include a disguise for the superhero, allows the superhero to live among normal people, uh, it functions to protect those who are close to the hero, it gives the hero access to situations where the hero's powers and abilities might be needed as a hero, so reporter, police scientist, uh, whatever uh, other types of scientists, whatever they might be. But the secret identity also has more structural, structural or ideological functions. So for example, um, it's usually important to the origin of the superhero. The secret identity is often a disguise for the superhero. And often, as in two of the most paradigmatic characters, uh, Clark Kent and Superman, Bruce Wayne and Batman, uh, the, the secret identity it takes the form of male inadequacy masking the superiority of the hero. It's very easy to view the secret identity superhero binary in gendered terms. So inadequate masculinity versus superior masculinity. The most well-known and the first model for this is, of course, Clark Kent. And part of this binary is the reaction of women in the hero's lives to the two halves of the superhero subject. So Lois Lane has a crush on or is in love with Superman, but she dismisses or has scorn for Clark Kent. This is again tied to masculinity. The common statement, oh Clark, why couldn't you be more like Superman? And notice that in this binary, the inferior masculinity of the secret identity versus the superior masculinity of the superhero identity, one thing that's missing is uh, normative masculinity. So typical masculinity, however that might be defined, is typically absent, or is often absent from this binary. Um, so Lois says, why couldn't you, she doesn't say, why can't you be like Superman? She says, why can't you be more like Superman? That is closer to the ideal, better than you are. So failure, 
more success with women than in, the, in terms of the, these two identities correlates with inadequate masculinity or superior masculinity. And Superman is, of course, the paradigm for this superhero secret identity binary, but it's replicated in other paradigmatic heroes, so Batman, Spider-Man, uh, the idle irresponsible playboy Bruce Wayne, the harried high school or college kid Peter Parker, and the relationships with their potential girlfriends. Now this, uh, this binary is far from universal. There are many, many unusual exceptions. But the success and the importance of characters like Superman and Batman uh, have shaped the general perception of this relationship between the secret identity and the superhero. Uh, to the point where this binary extends to paradigmatic superheroines as well, or rather the paradigmatic superheroine Wonder Woman. Uh, in Wonder Woman's, in, in older comic books, in Wonder Woman's secret identity is Diana Prince. She's mousy, unattractive, bespectacled naval secretary. It's a disguise for her superior femininity. And Wonder Woman's paramour, Steve Trevor, is hot for Wonder Woman, but he ignores that Diana Prince, the secretary. So again, success with, with, uh, with the, the love interest is a sign of superior masculinity or femininity versus uh, the opposite of that for the, for the inferior, inadequate masculinity or femininity. So I want to turn now to two examples, two major examples of Marvel superheroes where we see some of these issues play out. Um, both originated in the 1960s, both are very popular superheroes. Uh, they are both still current in the Marvel Universe and comic books. They are also part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with their own films. So I want to discuss Doctor Strange, Master of the Mystic Arts, and Thor, the Norse God of Thunder. So turn to Thor first. So Thor is arguably the most rich and complex example of a physician superhero. You can see here from Journey to Mystery 83, 1962, part of uh, Thor's origin story. Mild-mannered surgeon Donald Blake, who is lame in one leg, he says here a frail figure silhouetted against a bleak sky. He's, uh, he has to use a cane. Um, he's on vacation in Norway. He encounters an alien invasion. You see a strange alien spacecraft landing silently behind him. He uh, flees from the aliens. Uh, into a cave where he is trapped in a cave in. He finds a stick, a walking stick, in the cave and tries to use it to pry his way out from the rubble. Uh, this doesn't work, so he angrily strikes the stick against the rocks and finds himself transformed into the Norse god of thunder, Thor. And in this first story, he begins to discover the range of powers that he now possesses, as well as uh, the physical strength and the massive physique that comes with his, this Thor identity. So, frail surgeon Donald Blake versus Norse God of Thunder. It's a nice image, nicely contrasting the two masculinities embodied by these two identities. The superhero is it. It's time for mighty Thor to become weak Dr. Blake again. I hope no new menace shows up now, for I'd be helpless to fight it. So the inadequate masculinity of the secret identity, the superior masculinity of the superhero. So the choice of the combination of physician and lameness for the secret identity here, uh, in many ways, is just a typical disguise for the superhero. So Donald Blake, his identity as a surgeon, plus his physical weakness, is a strong, direct contrast to Thor's physical superiority. So Thor has muscular physique, supernatural strength and powers. He's very good at breaking things. He's good at fighting. He can fight supervillains, fight alien invaders, uh, and, and so on. Don Blake can't do that. So again, like Clark Kent or Superman, I'm sorry, like Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne, the, the uh, secret identity functioning as a disguise for the superhero identity. And in the case of Donald Blake, this extends to his relationship with women. 
In the second floor story, we are introduced to Don Blake's nurse, Jane Foster, his nurse and love interest. And here we have Don Blake thinking about his love for Jane. Jane is so beautiful. If only I could tell her how much she means to me, but I daren't. For a girl so lovely would never marry a, a lame man. And if she knew I loved her, she'd probably quit her job. Then I would never see her at all. So Blake, brilliant surgeon. Thanks to you, doctor, without your treatment, who knows what might have happened. Brilliant surgeon, but his lameness makes him inadequate in some way. Uh, makes him pre presented here as less of a man who is in love with his, with his nurse, but cannot express this. Afraid that she would, she would never go for a guy who is less than adequate. And this extends to uh, the end of the story after, uh, after Jane Foster has her first encounter with Thor. Um, she asks, by the way, doctor, where were you while all the fighting was going on? So I was uh, hiding behind the execution wall. I figured it was the safest place to be. <laughs> oh, I see. Hiding, golly, why couldn't you be a brave, brave and adventurous like Thor? But no, that would just be too much to hope for. So again, the typical superhero secret identity binary played out in terms of masculinity, heavily gendered, especially in relation to women. So the typical role for potential romantic interests of the secret identity and the superhero. Don Blake is inferior or inadequate, not good enough for her. Once Thor is introduced, he takes on the role of coward as well to disguise his superhero identity. Uh, and Jane reacts, why could you be more like? But here. <clears throat> However, the relationship between Donald Blake and Thor is not just a simple contrast between the masculinities represented by the secret identity and the superhero, as with Clark Kent versus Superman, for example. First of all, Don Blake is not simply a disguise or a performance. Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne, uh, at least in their public personas, are uh, pretending to be inferior men. Rather, Donald Blake actually becomes a different body with different thought processes, with different personality, with different speech patterns and the like when he turns into Thor. He becomes a different person. And furthermore, Donald Blake is not presented as inferior in his own abilities and identity. So Donald Blake has superior mental abilities and precise surgical skills, which are often brought to play in these Thor stories. In contrast, Thor has superior physical abilities. He's good at fighting and breaking things. So Thor can fight supervillains and monsters, which Blake cannot. But Blake can do things as a physician that Thor cannot do. He can heal people. Now, a third difference between uh, Donald Blake and Thor and many other superhero secret identity binaries is the fact that the Thor identity comes with a lot of baggage in these stories. Uh, one thing that it comes with is the entire Norse pantheon. So once he takes on the Thor identity, what comes with that is a father, Odin, a, half, a sinister half-brother, Loki, uh, the lady Sif, another girlfriend, as well as a, a host of other Norse gods and heroes. As well as the idea that Thor has been missing for a long time. So this raised the question among fans, what is the true relationship between the superhero and the secret identity? Who is Donald Blake? The implication here is that Donald Blake is Thor, but Thor is, has some sort of backstory that doesn't fit with the secret identity, with, this, with the secret identity physician role. So this was a question that Donald Blake himself finally decided he needed a definitive answer to. You see, I've got to know, I've got to know, who is Donald Blake? Next, the answer. So in 1968, we have uh, this, this question raised by Blake himself. And in the next issue, um, Odin tells, uh, ex explains to Thor why he is Thor and Donald Blake. So Thor is the powerful son of Odin. He is a god. He knows strength, but he is proud and irresponsible. So he sends Thor to Earth for him to learn humility. He says, Though thou art supreme in thy power and thy pride, thou must know weakness, thou must feel pain, but such lesson can ne'er be learned by thunder God. So, sends 
Thor to Earth to live as a mortal. He has to learn, Thor must need, need to learn weakness, pain, so he, so he can learn empathy and humility. So he sends him to Earth as a, uh, as a, as a mortal, a mortal with uh, no memories of his past, who, who shows up on a med school campus, which I think is kind of awesome. Uh, uh, he and just enrolls, enrolls in med school and never questions but he has no past. It's part of, Thor, uh, part of Odin's enchantment is to make this to you know, put Thor in this role as Donald Blake so that he can learn humility as a warrior. It's only when he learns these lessons and only through the Donald Blake as physician identity that he can learn these lessons that he learns that uh, Odin and Thor are, or, I'm sorry, Thor and Donald Blake are one and the same. <clears throat> uh, so as he says, Thou didst treat the sick and the afflicted, Thou didst walk amongst the weak and give them strength. Yet ever wert thou son of Odin, though thou knew it not. Twas I who placed thy hammer in earthly cave, so thou wouldst one day find it. And find it thou didst, <clears throat> when thy lesson had been learned, the lesson of humility. And let me just say that for those of us of a certain generation, uh, if you didn't go to Sunday school and learn this sort of faux uh, King James English from the Bible, you could learn it from Thor comic books. Although a kind of a not exactly correct version of it. So. so even if Blake is an invented identity, Thor and Donald Blake are the same person. Now despite this resolution, um, this raised questions. Uh, or rather, some writers continue to explore the relationship and contrast between the two identities and explore this as a problematic relationship. So here we have Thor, 1974, um, where he is ex specifically acknowledging that he is unable, and Thor can do some things, but only Donald Blake, the physician, can do other things. In this case, a goddess has been injured by an evil god, and Donald Blake has uh, Thor, in his Donald Blake identity, has performed surgery on her, and now he must go and check on her as Donald Blake, because that's something that Thor can't do. <clears throat> so, finding interesting ways to explore this relationship between the two identities, which extends to other questions, such as, um, you know, uh, why is Donald Blake never around? He's a brilliant surgeon. He could be helping many, many people, but he's absent all the time because Thor is, you know, tends to be in far distant places, other worlds, space, Asgard, or the like, doing superhero things. So it's very difficult to maintain a serious medical practice if you are in other parts of the universe fighting supervillains. So you see, I saw what you did, I watched you work. You're a very gifted man, Dr. Blake. Few surgeons can ever hope to gain your skill. You're control. Can you tell me why you've been gone so long? Think of the patients you could have, please don't say it, Dr. Reddy. I do think of it. And, I, and may heaven help me, I wish I knew what to do. So this identity crisis, uh, this tension between the two identities, and we have played out further in the story where Thor, who is, may or may not be often you're drinking with another god, Hercules, uh, expresses this tension specifically. He says, uh, you know, specifically stating it as uh, physician's training on the one hand versus, as he says, a glory hunting thunder god on the other. So clearly positing the, the heroic masculinity of Thor against a different kind of heroic masculinity of the physician Donald Blake. So rather than inadequacy versus superiority, we have two competing masculine positions, uh, positions here, the competent doctor and the, the, uh, the muscle-bound, uh, tough guy superhero. Um, I noticed that even in this scenario, uh, the presence of another strong and divine superhero helps the scenario play out. Uh, there is someone to fill in for Thor while Don Blake is having an identity crisis, uh, uh, an identity crisis specifically tied to his responsibilities as a physician versus his responsibilities as a superhero. Nonetheless, 
these tensions between the superhero and the doctor were rarely played out much further than this. After all, Thor and Don Wake were, in fact, two faces of Thor rather than two completely different identities. Don Wake was as much the son of Odin as, uh, as his alter ego. And during the 1980s, uh, Marvel began finding creative ways to shed the Don Wake identity altogether. So removing the enchantment from Thor so that uh, we have Thor as only Thor, with only one body. He's no longer Donald Blake. So in this case, any secret identity would be only a disguise. And in fact, when this actually came up uh, in the Thor comic books, um, when Thor no longer had the Donald Blake identity to disguise himself as, uh, Mick Fury, the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, his solution to find a secret identity for uh, uh, Thor was to reach into his desk and pull out a pair of glasses and hand them to him and say, well, work for that other guy. There's a little bit of cross-universe play there. Um, <clears throat> so now the familiar Thor of the Marvel Universe is just Thor, the god of thunder. Um, the, I'm sorry, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So there's no Don Blake identity in the Marvel films. Uh, Don Blake, in fact, is only mentioned very briefly as Jane Foster's ex-boyfriend. So it's more of a jokey Easter egg for fans, and that is the extent of his presence. Which means there's no potential for medical drama there's no, uh, or, or medical spectacle as you had in older Thor comics, as, as you just saw uh, pointed at. And these, these stories included numerous examples of Blake in surgery, in the operating room, doing work as a physician. Which leads to the other probably best known physician in the superhero genre, Doctor Strange. Doctor Stephen Strange, one of the Marvel Universe's master of the mystic arts and Earth's Sorcerer Supreme. Um, several months after Doctor Strange's first appearance in early 1963, his origin story was given. This is also 1963, and, and Stephen Strange is a famous surgeon, but he's arrogant, he's conceited, he's greedy, he is, uh, as it says here, um, uh, proud, haughty, successful. So, extremely accomplished surgeon, but not a nice guy. He's a bad guy. So he's very bad personality traits. He's in a car accident, which causes nerve damage to his hands. He's no longer able to perform surgery. He spends his fortune trying to find a cure, and his search ultimately leads him to the Ancient One, who instead trains him in the mystic arts. Now, the physician status of Dr. Strange, uh, MD, does not really inform his status as Dr. Strange, Master of the Mystic Arts, beyond the origin story. Uh, in this case, as with Dr. Midnight, several decades, or a couple decades earlier, two decades earlier, the, uh, the physician identity is a way to uh, explain certain aspects of the superhero's origin and, and powers. But there's really not much more done with that physician identity. Um, but notice how in this case, one, uh, the one meaning of doctor, the doctor is expert, and so the doctor is medical doctor, is physician, leads very logically to the other doctor meaning, the doctor is expert. So Dr. Strange, physician, is now Dr. Strange, master of the mystic arts and sorcerer supreme. Now, one interesting thing about the recent introduction of Doctor Strange into the Marvel Cinematic Universe last year in the film Doctor Strange, uh, directed by Scott Derrickson, and starring Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange, uh, <laughs> this film was a remarkably faithful adaptation of the, of the sort of basics of the original 1963 origin. The, the, the film plays a lot with Doctor Stephen Strange as a physician, about his accident, his arrogance, his accident, his quest to be cured, his discovery of the ancient ones, and uh, as a result, and his training in the mystic arts. Um, it also allowed, for the first time, uh, a mainstream superhero film to heavily use the iconography of the popular medical drama genre. This is very unusual for the superhero genre, but it's central to the Doctor Strange film. Uh, and this even extends to the combination of superhero spectacle and medical drama spectacle. So, for example, what this is supposed to be is, is an image of, of uh, uh, Strange's uh, astral projection, the astral form of his body. Well, his physical body is lying, dying on a operating table, 
and a fellow physician ex-girlfriend of his is, is working desperately to save his life, and then in his astral form, he has a fight with a villain in astral form in this operating room, which allows for you know things to get knocked over by invisible beings and things like so, so combining superhero spectacle with the spectacle of medical drama. It's never really been done in the superhero genre, and certainly in film before. Occasionally you have those gestures in something like Thor comics, but not to this degree. So this unexpected combination of the, the spectacle of the superhero uh, with that of, of another popular mainstream genre. <clears throat> Medical doctors occupy many other corners of the mainstream superhero genre. So you have supporting characters, which my final image here. You have supporting characters, uh, providing medical assistance. So for example, Bruce Wayne's faithful butler, Alfred Pennyworth, uh, in more recent decades been redefined as an ex-military field medic. So he has field medic training, which makes a lot of sense if your boss is a superhero with no superpowers who needs, who could use somebody to fix him up, especially as the superhero genres become more dark and violent in recent decades. Um, uh, Dr. Claire Temple, uh, a physician in older Luke Cage comic books in the Marvel Universe, who is was turned into the nurse played by Rosario Dawson in the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe uh, Netflix series, beginning at Daredevil. Um, emergency surgeon Christine Palmer, who is the uh, in the Doctor Strange film, is the ex-girlfriend of Stephen Strange. But uh, her name was taken from one of the characters in Marvel's short-lived 1970s medical drama series, Night Nurse, which is a short-lived comic book aimed at uh, selling comic books to girls. Um, you also look at psychiatrists. So Marvel's Dr. Druid, who was a psychiatrist and occultist. Uh, Marvel's Doc Samson, who was a super strong superhero psychiatrist. Um, other villains associated with medicine in some way. So Batman villain Jonathan Crane, the Scarecrow, who was a psychologist and psychopharmacologist specializing in fear and hallucinatory drugs. Uh, the Batman villain Dr. Hugo Strange, who goes way, way back to the earliest days of Batman, um, has been an inventor, a physician, a, phys a psychiatrist, depending on the needs of the writer. Um, so I could pursue any of these other minor examples, but instead I want to conclude by mentioning the recent Japanese superhero television series, Kamen, uh, Kamen Rider X-Aid. Um, Kamen Rider is a TV series uh, originally begun in 1971, as created by Shintaro Ishinomori, Ishinomori uh, who was the creator of the Japanese TV series that eventually became the familiar Power Rangers in the United States. Uh, and this is a TV series that in for the last decade or 15 years or so, is, it's a series that's constantly renewed every season, uh, uh, typically 40 to 45 to 50 episode TV series, a couple of feature films, um, a renewal of the characters using certain basic tropes that are familiar across the series, but are, are renewed primarily with the goal of selling new toys every year to kids. Uh, so new, new characters, new heroes, new powers uh, aimed at the market. Um, so this is Common Rider x last season, 2016 to 2017's iteration of Common Rider. Um, and this is the story of Imu Hojo, this young uh, pediatric intern in the middle of this group here, who gains video game themed superpowers. Uh, video game themed superpowers. Of course, one fan once described uh, initial images of the Kamen Rider x persona. It sort of looks like the 1980s puked on Kamen Rider. But, but in addition to the superhero and video game themes, the series features extensive medical drama. Um, other physicians are superheroes and supervillains, in addition to the main character also with video game themed identities and powers, but there are that. So Common Rider, while certainly being the most complex exploration of the possibilities opened up by 
the joining of superheroes and video games, is unquestionably the most complex exploration of the possibilities opened up by physicians, physicians as superheroes. And certainly the longest, so 45 TV episodes, four feature films, numerous additional web-based episodes, uh, and some video game spin-offs. So I end with this because it's ironic, perhaps, that this would be part of Japanese popular culture, where the superhero has never had quite as much iconic cultural cachet as in the United States, uh, but where the physician superhero, uh, where in the US, the physician superhero has had a long, but ultimately fairly sparse presence since the beginning of the genre in comic books uh, of the late 1930s, and of course, even earlier, in the adventures of Dr. Clark Savage, Jr., or Dr. Savage. Thank you. I was really intrigued uh, how many physicians you could make uh, in this. Uh, I, I'm not an expert, <laughs> but uh, I was really floored with how many actually exist in this. Well, I think more, more accurately, given the vast number of superheroes, what I named was fairly comprehensive. So there's not many. There may be a, what I named is about it. There really aren't that many. And, and so, there are some other that you forgot. Dr. Kirk Connors, the lizard. Yeah. Uh, Medical Bad, researcher. Uh, mm -hmm. Bad, uh, Mobius. Okay. Dr. Mobius. So medical researcher, that's true, yeah. yeah. These are all, and again, yeah. the case where they're characters whose, uh, whose abilities as superheroes or supervillains is tied yeah. to their medical research origins, yeah. but their physician identities don't factor that much into their hero identities or villain identities beyond the, game, the, the, the rationale for having the superpowers. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you could say something about when there is representation of the medical profession, what is actually being represented? Because to be a physician means to do a lot of different things. It means everything from performing surgery to kind of doing admin to following up with patients to, you know, so there's monotony in it as well. Does it tend to just be focusing on a kind of life or death moment of, of the life saving? I mean, is there is there any kind of sense of any of these representations looking at underrepresented parts of the physician experience? Or for instance, that, that great thing where in a film you try to show how exciting research looks by trying to like, mask it in some sort of like style. Is there any attempt to show like what medical research looks like in any comprehensive way or anything like that? Uh, comprehensively, no. The, what you would get would be the fruits of medical research, such as infrared goggles that allow Dr. Midnight to see during the daytime. Or, or things like that. But just typically, medical research, aka science, uh, with all of the sort of iconography of science, test tubes, more test tubes, whatever it might be, <laughs> or surgery, the life and death scenarios. Uh, that's one reason why the brief exploration of the, the tension between Thor's identities in, the 19, in that, that, that very short of story arc uh, in 1974, um, it has Donald Blake, it has Thor turning back into the Donald Blake identity to check on his patient, uh, to follow up with this, this woman that he's done, this goddess that he's done surgery on. So, you know, so those additional responsibilities of the physician outside of the operating room uh, are played with there, and that's one place I showed it because it's such an anomaly. So in general, it really is the, the uh, you know, life and death surgery, saving the life of the, the person, administering emergency first aid or something like that, which you even have a little bit of in that first, um, that first Dr. Midnight image from 2000, uh, or research. The reason I kind of asked it is that, and if you think about something like ER, which maybe this is so common writer I'd say it gets closer to, you can't just have a sustained fever pitch the entire episode of Life or Death. There's all these kind of down moments of other things that doctors do when they're interacting with one another. So I'm finding, feeling, feel like if there were to be a proliferation of this, that it might be in those moments that interesting things could happen, right? Or that, you know, kind of diversification of the show. 
Mm. But I feel like, yeah, that something like a serialized television show, when you, out of necessity, need to just invent more stuff to do, mm. that that could be an option for every single show. So. Well, in, this, in the case of this, the, you fill all those gaps with, with people playing video games. Uh, <laughs> <There you laughs> <go. laughs> demonstrating his skills in another, his, a different skill set. Because he's, in addition to being a pediatric intern, he's also a master video game player. So, um, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could, if you have any ideas why, so the Thor, so Marvel pretty much dropped Dr. Blake, he's not in the movies at all, whereas with, um, with the Hulk, Doctor, the Dr. Banner Hulk thing is there the whole time, now even though there was a time in the 90s where he was Hulk all the time and he was, he had all his personalities unified. Why do you think they, there was that kind of difference between those two series? Oh, well, of course, in this case, Dr. Banner is a scientist as opposed to a physician, so there's that. But more to the point is, is that the Hulk is an unwanted persona. He doesn't want to become the Hulk. The Hulk is, a, you know, it's when he loses control, he becomes angry. And this has always been a characteristic of the, of the, the, the tension between the two identities is, is um, uh, Bruce Banner does not want to become the Hulk, though he will if he's threatened or whatever, if he gets angry enough. And the Hulk does not really want to be weak Banner. And this is played out over and over and over again in comics. And then, of course, played with, as you described, where the, the, you know, the identities are merged or modified or, or things like that. But in general, it's because it's, the Jack, it's a Jekyll and Hyde relationship as opposed to uh, a secret identity superhero relationship where the, the Hulk is. His superhero, his status as a superhero is very atypical. He's you know, much more out of control and the like. So I think that's the reason for that. It, it makes that character much more fascinating than, to be, to be honest, the Don Blake Thor dichotomy. So, and I, I was also interested. One, one more comment. It was also interesting that in the in the early Donald Blake, he is like rail thin. Yeah. But then, like ten years later, he's not. You know, he's not Thor buff. Mm -hmm. But he's not a weakling either, mm -hmm. so they kind of buffed him up a little bit. It looks like. Yeah, it's changing art styles. Uh, you see that a lot with other characters as well. I think uh, just based on who the artists are, and as, for example, as Marvel becomes more successful, bring in more artists who are, you know, who basically a little greater range of art styles. So I, I can easily imagine Rail Thin Blakes and other. Context. Well, actually, no, I think about it. I, don't think you, I think you're right. I don't think beyond those earliest curly years, you don't have quite that, that degree of, of rail thinness, as you said. So that's a good point. <clears throat> yeah. I, I thought with Dr. Strange, you brought up the thing at the beginning. You said Doc Savage correctly has no secret identity. The same is true with Dr. Strange. <clears throat> he, the whole, the whole fantastic, there are superheroes. He, the whole Fantastic Four, for example, Nick Fury, who you also mentioned, or for that matter, Doctor Doom, have no secret identity. Mm -hmm. They're just simply, everybody knows who they are. Yes. Um, and also one other comment, when you looked at the um, panel there of the Doctor Midnight and mm -hmm. this thing, if you ever watched the British show Doctor Who, mm -hmm. they did a Christmas episode a couple of years ago, Return of Doctor Mysterio, you see him picking up a Superman comic and saying, wait a minute, look at the size of the face here, and the glasses here. Clark Kent is Superman! <laughs> all, all of a sudden, he realizes it, so you have good company. Yeah, I like the, um, uh, uh, your comment about the, the superhero super identity binary. As I mentioned, there are many, many exceptions. Uh, possibly more exceptions than the rule, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it questionable as a rule. But as I say, since Clark Kent and Superman and Bruce Wayne and Batman are sort of paradigmatic models. They're sort of the ones in the popular imagination. So for example, um, well, between 1938 and 1978, you've had Superman, you've had Clark Kent represented in a variety of different ways, such as the absolutely competent uh, Clark Kent of the 1950s TV show, The Adventures of Superman. In the 1978 film, you have Christopher Reeve playing Clark Kent as a sort of bumbling stumbling, awkward guy, specifically as a mask for the superhero identity. Um, 
My favorite example of an exception would be pertaining to the gender issue where women, the, 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 um, uh, the, the whole, why can't you be more like Batman, or why can't you be more like, like Superman Clark, that statement is uh, the Golden Age Sandman, the Sandman character from the 1940s, who's uh, the only person who knew that, he was a super, that, that uh, the character was a superhero was his girlfriend, who would drive him to crime scenes to help him out. So that's a really good deal. If the only person who knows that you are super is your girlfriend, it's a lot better than Clark Kent's situation with Lois Lane, where Lois despises Clark Kent. So, well, that was an editorial decision. And the, I've seen the artwork. Originally, I think it was Superman 8. Lois was going to figure it out. He was going to tell her. But that was how Siegel, because they thought it was tiring, mm -hmm. Siegel and Schuster. They thought it was tiring, and they were going to have it revealed. And then she was, Lois was going to be, mm -hmm. like you said, driving him, so to speak, be Margot Lane. Oh, and sure. mm -hmm. But the editors at DC killed him. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, it wasn't until the early 90s that finally. Yeah. The genie came and, out uh, of the bag. Yeah, with Superman composing the lowest line. That's right. Well, yes. but, but, so, so the idea was there fairly early, but the editorial editor said no. Hmm. Well, the threat to the secret identity became such a common uh, trope in the 40s and 50s, where comic book covers would be totally devoted to the unexpected revelation or discovery of the superhero's true identity. And sometimes it's took really bizarre turns, such as in the early 40s, very early 40s when the, the Fleischer Studio Superman cartoons came out, there was actually a comic book story in which uh, Clark Kent and Lois Lane go to a screening of Fleischer Studios Superman cartoons and Clark has to find ways to distract Lois from seeing his true identity revealed in the cartoon on screen, which makes no sense whatsoever, <laughs> but it's really fun, it's really entertaining. <clears throat> Very interesting your comment when you were talking about uh, physicians in the sort of side roles mm -hmm. that uh, psychiatrist was the villain. And you know, medical students here at Pitt put uh, every year they spoof play uh, Scope and Scalpel at the end of the fourth year. And they always laugh from two specialties, and psychiatry is one of them. That's sort of like easy one to do. So it, it seems funny to me that you know they gave the easy specialty to the villain, mm -hmm. but the hero is surgeon, which is a whole different one. Well, there are some exceptions, like Marvel Comics Doc, Sam, uh, yeah, Doc Samson, who is a huge, burly, big, huge guy with green, long, flowing green hair as a result of. Gamma rays. He's a he's a character tied to the Hulk, uh, who is uh, a, you know in, you know invulnerable, super strong, but he's still a psychiatrist. He's, and actually, he occasionally gives psychiatric services to other superheroes in need uh, and the like. So there are a handful of more Marvels. Doctor Drew. Well, who, there's also Doctor Connors Dover, who moves down. He's okay. also a psychiatrist too, mm -hmm. but he's yeah. also a supervillain. So there are, there are, there are, there are any psychoanalysts? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no. Well, uh, Scarecrow is a uh, pharmacologist, so not exactly, but, but he's not doing, he's like, like, doing like, you know, Freudian analysis of... No. <laughs> well, if you want that, you have to turn to, um, after the, the, the Commerce Code shut down crime and, uh, crime and horror comments in the 1950s, and, Easy Comics short-lived series of psychoanalysis. Uh, four issues of four dramas of psychoanalysis with the same psychoanalyst hero. It's all talking all the time in which the hero helps these four patients work out their traumas over the course of these four issues before they gave up because no one was buying it. <laughs> but um, is that one of those for me. So it's, it's pretty great, yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.